Continuing education knows that at the end, students want to graduate and we can help them do that because we take the time to really listen to their needs and we understand all the different options that are available across the campus for them. We don't take a cookie cutter approach. We realize each student comes with their own story. So whether it's a part-time student looking to complete a degree program or someone just looking for online courses, we're there to connect them to the resources of the university. April 10th, 2024, it is 1.30, and this is panel number 18042, titled Gaming in Immersive Spaces. My name is Chris Lassard, and I'm gonna be your moderator today. I'm the CEO of Monkey Bubble, where we specialize in creating unforgettable gaming and entertainment events. I also work as a commentator for various gaming publishers like Blizzard Entertainment and Riot Games. And before diving into all of that esports stuff, I cut my teeth at a company here called Boulder Games, where we crafted our own independent games and immersive experiences for themed entertainment. Um, before we get started and introduce our wonderful panel here as well, I would like to read the land acknowledgement here. The University of Colorado Boulder, uh, Colorado's flagship university, honors and recognizes the many contributions of indigenous peoples in our state. CU Boulder acknowledges that it is located on the traditional territories and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and many other Native American nations. Their forced removal from these territories has caused devastating and lasting impacts. While the University of Colorado Colorado Boulder can never undo or rectify the devastation wrought on indigenous peoples. We commit to improving and enhancing engagement with indigenous peoples and issues locally and globally. We will do this by recognizing and amplifying the voices of indigenous CU Boulder students, staff, and faculty in their work, educating, conducting research, supporting student success, and integrating indigenous knowledge, consulting, engaging, and working collaboratively with tribal nations to enhance our ability to provide access and culturally sensitive support and to recruit, retain, and graduate Native American students in a climate that is inclusive and respectful. One other thing before we get fully started here is I'd like to mention is that we want to make sure that you know that you have a chance to ask questions as well. Here's how we'll handle the Q&A. We'll reserve the end of the discussion for that Q&A. We're using a note card system to receive questions from the audience. At any time in the session, simply raise your hand to request a note card and pencil from one of our producers. Please write legibly. If you are a student, please note this is in your question on the card. When you finish, raise your hand to hand it to the producer who will bring it up to me. I urge everyone to please make your questions brief and to the point. And now I'm going to do a brief introduction for each panelist. So next to me, I have Moses Ma. Moses Ma wears many hats, video game designer, artist, internet visionary, high-tech entrepreneur, filmmaker, physicist, and a martial artist. Credited for pioneering, pioneering network games through Spectre VR, he now leads Future Lab. Their focus, AI, blockchain, enterprise computing, mobile apps, pandemic management, and tackling the societal impact of a generative, uh, generative AI. Next to Moses, we have Billy Carney. Billy Carney is the chairman and co-founder of Roka News, a digital media company transforming news consumption for young audiences. Since its launch in 2020, Roka News has amassed 5 million followers and subscribers across social media, its app and Roka uh, and newsletter. With $6 million in venture funding, it's one of the world's fastest growing news platforms. Carney previously worked as an investment banker at Bank of America, Merrill Lynch in New York City, and he graduated from the University of Notre Dame in 2018, and is also a recent addition to the Forbes 30 Under 30. And finally, we have Jake Sally, previously at Riot, this one with a Y, Verizon's uh, content innovation arm. He spearheaded content development use, utilizing cutting edge tech like VR, AR, AI, 5G, and motion capture. His work has graced prestigious platforms from the Super Bowl to Cannes, winning awards such as BAFTA's Emmy and a Peabody. A Princeton University alum, Sally is a force to the intersection of technology and entertainment. So, you know, the who and the what, so let's talk about the why that we are here. So, uh, we're just going to start pretty simple and easy with what is the future of gaming? We're talking about immersive spaces in the title of this particular panel, but really we're talking about where gaming is going. So in your opinion and in your experience, we'll start with Jake. Um, what is the future of gaming and immersive uh, experiences for you? Yeah, I think there's two, two different tracks when I think about it. What's, what's keeping me up at night presently? Um, on one track, I think gaming is going to start to get more personalized as we start to utilize AI to have conversations, 
to have quests, to have achievements and goals that are more and more and more specific to you based on the inputs that you provide it with. So that's kind of one big piece of it. Um, and the other one I think is gonna be uh, the more immersive side of things. Uh, personally, I've been working in VR and AR pretty exclusively for the last 10 years. I've produced about 40 XR projects. I think we're not quite there yet. I've used the Apple Vision Pro a lot <laughs> right now. Um, we got some room to go. But I do think for mobile, there's a lot of sensors on that device that billions of people have that are very, very, very underutilized. And I think we're starting to hit the inflection point where the processing power of those devices is really going to unlock kind of this next wave of gaming experiences that are contextual to your spaces rather than you kind of like imagining going to other spaces. I play a lot of games, love PlayStation, Xbox, we were just talking about the Steam Deck earlier. <laughs> um, those are all really enjoyable, but I think, and we'll get into this a little bit later, the ability for you to have experiences that matter in spaces that matter to you, your bedroom, your office, on your breaks, of course, <laughs> and your friend's spaces is gonna really be kind of where this is all headed. Awesome, yeah, so I guess what the future of gaming and, and kind of the immersion of it, uh, what it means to me, is the blurring of the lines between real life and gaming. And I guess what I mean by that is on one side, gaming is going into reality and, or rather, let's start with reality going into gaming. So you have like these things that you're buying, right, in Fortnite, whether it's a skin or in other games, these cosmetic uh, enhancements that really provide no value, but people are willing to pay for. Um, and kind of, I think, a cool, example of this is in a game called RuneScape, which is an older game. Uh, it's like this online game where it's kind of a medieval setting. You can slay dragons and interact with other people, and there's a whole economy within the game. There's a part of the game that if you go to it, all the players there are speaking Spanish. And throughout the rest of this entire online game, everybody speaks English. The reason they speak Spanish there is because a few years ago, a few people from Venezuela going through an economic crisis realized that the RuneScape economy was more stable than their own countries. And so this group of people, they essentially farmed the resources within this game and turn around and sell it for real life profit. And that's become a livable, a living wage in Venezuela, probably more than that, uh, which is pretty remarkable. On the other side of it, uh, gaming coming into, you know, real life, like you can look at Duolingo and, uh, there are now more people learning language through du Duolingo's gamified language learning platform than there are uh, US high school students taking language classes. Uh, so pretty remarkable. Um, it's actually been a couple of lifetimes in internet dog years for me. <laughs> but uh, one of my first products was the first commercially successful internet game. It's called Spectre. And one of the things we learned was that it pays off to understand the neurophysiology of gaming. So I remember we moved into a new office and I looked really hard for an office abandoned by an advertising company because I wanted to be able to do uh, blink rate response tracking. So we had you know, a one-way mirror and we had these cameras with very big lenses that magnified and counted the number of blinks while they were playing. And the less you blink, the more engaged you are. Um, to give you an idea of one of the other tests we did, often uh, when I had a video game company, whenever I visited my mom, all of her friend's kids would come and beg me for a summer job, right? And I had this one line to make her friends like me, uh, when you bring your mom straight A's, you can come work for me. So they actually started studying really hard to do that. And when they got it, I didn't have my lab. So I came up with this other way of measuring immersion, which is I let them get started with the game, then I put a bowl of ice cream next to them. If the ice cream melted, I would have a hit. So you have to do that kind of immersion level. So the thing I'm actually looking for in the future is, you know, when quantum computing comes out and we have AI kind of expressed and these 3D worlds are automatically generated, I actually think that the equivalent of opium dens will open uh, and digital opium will be served. And people will basically strap in and spend like 20 hours playing a game 
in a fully assisted way, right? So, you know, all of your bodily functions taken care of. Uh, I think these will actually be assisted by um, microdoses of hallucinogens. And I predict that's going to happen because that's already happening now. People uh, in the, not the dark web, but in the edge of gaming, they're, they're experimenting now with various synthetic drugs uh, with VR to see if it would enhance the experience. So that kind of stuff is very interesting to me as a cultural phenomenon. I think that when that happens, we have a hit that will actually open a new level of gaming because some research will come out of it that will teach us how to do highly immersive games. And that's actually a goal that we should all strive for. Any responses to the digital opium dens? Love it. <laughs> and yeah, I'm really curious, you know, in the age where we're kind of like already, you know, Dune 2 came out, ain't no way there were, you know, you know there are people that are going, smoking a joint, going into those experiences. Do you feel like there are um, primitive versions of this digital opium that exist today, or there's some threshold of immersion that's required for it to really hit? Great question. Yeah, I, I think ecstasy is already being used in uh, community games so that they can actually feel a connection, a better sense of connection. But I think the thing that actually you want to do is trigger that hypnopompic state where you actually let go and the uh, dreamlike state happens. And that will happen with some drug, and I'm sure a biohacker is going to figure that out. Now, actually, the thing I'm afraid of the most is uh, CRISPR home kits. Right, because they'll be able to start biohacking. And what we'll probably do is somebody's going to mix it with some fungus, and next thing you know, you have a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> but I, I think that biohacking with uh, games hacking will actually have an effect. And it's not a bad thing. You just have, you know it's going to happen. And when that happens, it's going to be a transition to a new, new kind of entertainment where you literally take a drug and you do this experience. And it's guided, but you're actually in an active dream state while you're doing it. I, I have a question as well. Um, so the I kind of would love to hear you elaborate a bit more about how you see these full body experiences taking place in practicality because I guess the main thing that popped into my head is, you know, from what I hear, uh, if you take, say, psilocybin, for instance, it's hard to look at a screen. like you know, there's a nausea effect and it's like, there's so much going on. I guess like how, how do you kind of see it taking place? Yeah, I, actually I read a uh, kind of hard to find blog post about a, a VR developer testing uh, various drugs. And he said there were drugs that actually lent into that experience instead of fought against it. And I think the other issue is the lag time. Uh, the, the, the Vision Pro actually has a very short lag time. Do uh, you know why Apple's so good at uh, the use of mice and lag time? It's because Steve Jobs was a games designer, and, and Nolan Bushnell told him uh, the time it takes for a finger response to get to the brain is like 40 milliseconds, so the transfer delay rate for a mouse has to be in the order of 40 to 50 milliseconds. He was the first one to encode that into the hardware, and that's why it worked. But I think those uh, issues could be solved with the uh, lag time delay. You, you know, our first game, uh, we, we actually did those killing games. Yeah. When I had a video game come, the reason I didn't want the game business anymore is the board demanded killing games. I never did games that killed, right? I did a, a flight, the first flight simulator uh, that you could land on a carrier. And I only did it to get a ride on a backseat on a carrier. Right? <laughs> and it worked. The, uh, the captain of the Lexington called and said, hey, you want to get it right? And we said, we'll be there. So the top designer and I, we backseated and landed on the carrier right before a reporter died, and they stopped doing that. So we were just, just got in there. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think it's difficult. So that's all I can say. Awesome. I did not expect that to go that direction, let me tell you. Um, but I'm glad that it did, because I think that what we're going to end up talking about, too, is the ethics of consumption just in general um, when it comes to gaming and immersive experiences, because I think a lot of people look at things like Ready Player One, for example, as a negative, right? That if we do feed into these things, that's going to be where we end up, where the environment and society will crumble, and the only working parts of it will be digital. So what would you say, Moses, like to someone who's concerned about that, based on where we're going right now, and based on what we just talked about? About. Yeah, I, th I think where you do your machine learning is really important. Uh, if I took the uh, Instagram and Facebook feeds, 
you're gonna end up with an AI that's more interested in popularity. So we have a product now called, um, that we're developing called AI Mastermind, where we use AI to teach AI. And what we did is we realized that you learn most effectively not because of a subject or content, but because the teacher cared about you. So we break it down so there's peer coaching that goes along with the content. And we're actually capturing what the peer coaches say uh, in these little study groups after we do an AI class. Uh, and what we tell those co-facilitators is um, try to be loving and caring because our AIs are learning how you're doing that. The hardest uh, machine learning stuff to get is can I actually follow the Dalai Lama for a year and learn how they speak and then do machine learning off of that. And so we wanted people to teach with uh, compassion and capture that and bring that into the AI. And that would be the most valuable, um, you know, AI that I could think of because it captures the compassion rent necessary for uh, education to be useful. And I think we could reuse that in other areas. What do you guys think of that? Is it too woo-woo for you? I, I think you know a lot more about it than I do. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, you, you know, frankly, people always talk about how we may end up there, but I, I think at the end of the day, like, humans, you know, fingers crossed, don't intrinsically want to be, you know, sitting for, like, their entire lives. You know, in a Wally -E scenario, like, nobody looks at that and goes, wow, movie. I wish that was me. Yeah. Um, and so I... I find it hard to believe we're going to get to that point. Also, the idea of, you know, an iRobot scenario where AI rebels, the, seemingly there would have to be some nefarious intent behind the AI. And if it's being taught properly, it doesn't, to me, register as something that's going to be a, a true concern. Cool. Yeah, I think we're, we're quite a ways out. I don't know, been in it for a decade, have seen, again, some really, really crazy leaps. You know, when I was doing my first VR experiences, there was massive lag time. You had you were plugged in, there were like seven different cables that were going on and now we're kind of at the point where you're like, for a thousand bucks you can have infinite virtual worlds in your backpack. Like, we're, we are moving at a pace that's interesting, but I do think in terms of having large scale networked experiences with no lag time, 4K per eye, which is kind of now the threshold that we need to be at for people to be like, I want to spend my time doing that versus looking at my phone. It's a really, really, really big leap <laughs> um, to get there. Um, now that said, I love gaming. I'll game for 10 hours a day, like totally comfortably. Um, but, um, you know, I think some of these things also can ideally be inspiring for people to want to go outside. Like we're at the base of the flat irons. It's mythic outside, <laughs> you know? And I think if you have that as like a immersive wallpaper, like you're gonna hit an inflection point where you're kind of curious, like, where is this exactly? Um, so I think it's something people are always doomsaying about. It's always kind of further out than people think it is. And the threshold to get there is quite high. But I do think that, you know, the responsibility of content creators is to make things that are, you know, really stoke your inner flame. Like you as a person are excited about that. I've played games that have made me cry. You know, like those games exist now. I think the vernacular of the medium of gaming has kind of crossed a threshold where you can actually evoke the same emotion that you evoke with a book or a movie. Um, so that's why I think where it gets exciting. Um, now, can everyone do that all simultaneously? Blah, blah, blah. I don't think we're there yet. <laughs> <laughs> Human emotion through technology facilitation is yeah. a, a term that I've, I've heard before. And it's not, I think the empathy ma machine has been kind of played out at this point. Um, again, like, you know the people who came up with that, it's great, it's like a good, interesting starting point. There's some really, really interesting museum experiences where it's like, you know, you are, you and uh, or myself and like, woman would like switch bodies, like there are crazy experiences where you um, take on the role of like a custom security officer, like there's all sorts of crazy, crazy, crazy pieces like that, but you, you know, it's hard to do that as like a fun consumer experience, like you can't spend, you know, you're not gonna like wrap up work, have a beer and like cry your eyes out for six hours, like that's hard. You, you know, I, I don't know why I'm um, going to say this, uh, it just came to me, but George Lucas once said, 
uh, my entire life could be explained in one story that when I made THX 1138, I made it with my head. When I made Happy Days, I made it with my heart. But when I made Star Wars, I made it with my hands and I was a child. So he actually went from adult to teenage to child, right, for, mm -hmm. for his uh, arc. I realized that I'm the opposite direction. My first products were like for the kid. I made them with my hands and they were games. Uh, my second products were these e-commerce systems. They were like based on uh, you know, a finance and, and becoming, a, in my 30s, I want to be serious. But what I want to do now is actually build stuff that changes the world, right? It actually has a social component and impact that makes the world a better place and can be a legacy. Uh, so the one thing that made me sell my video com game company is my marketing person said, oh, we just got 10 million users. And then I multiplied in my head that the average playtime was $100. And I had just destroyed one billion productive hours, right? That was like lost. The people couldn't get that back. And I thought, wow, if they spent that time learning a new skill or like caring about their families, that would have been a better world. And I said, I can't make games anymore. So that's why I got mm -hmm. out of the games business because it was time to grow up. And I think that games have to do that. When you build games, it can't just be about the having more users and making more money. They need a social component and it's not about making a better world, it's about making better people. All right, so we're talking about now like the individual and their interaction with you know the medium of a gaming. And I think something that a lot of people don't understand is how much gamification there is outside of gaming, uh, for example. That there are a lot of social media sites, news sites, which we'll talk about in just a second, that use uh, gamification, which is adding gaming elements to your platform or whatever you're doing to kind of you know get that part fed in your brain. And so at Roka News, um, at Billy, you're doing some gamified experiences when it comes to consuming the news. Um, so how does this affect the consumption of that news? And how do you make it an authentic experience so you're not just using gaming to get higher numbers, that it's actually adding to the experience on your platform? <clears throat> yeah, so we, um, so my company's called Roka News, as mentioned, and we have an app, and it's a gamified news app. And the way it works is that you'd come on, and uh, there's kind of two aspects of gamification. One that's kind of meta, in that you uh, read a story, you get experience points, which we'll talk about in a second. And uh, you can also play actual games. For one of our games, you're shown a picture of a story that's going on somewhere in the world, and you have to guess where in the world that story takes place before you read it. So there's like the geography component, like the geo-guesser aspect, and then also the news itself. Um, in terms of the user interaction, how that is affected, one, we, we do try to be a bit careful in how we build it around the actual reading of the news so it's not uh, over the top. The other part of it is that we want these things that occur to have these actions to be incentivized by a certain result. So, if you're just getting experience points for reading a story, it's like, who gives a damn, you know, like, okay, uh, I leveled up to level two, that means nothing to me. So, we tried to build things within the experience that allow people to have that action and then go on to actually learn more within the app and interact with it more. Uh, one example of this is that as you level up uh, through certain seasons we have within our app, so for a few months there's a theme, right now it's World War One. we'll have another theme in a few months, uh, you unlock exclusive content that we've made about World War I, and you read the entire history of the war in the app as you're reading the news itself. So it's kind of what's going on today, and also, you know, how did we build this world that we've gotten to today? Uh, in addition to that, you can unlock avatars and certain things related to World War I and kind of deepen the experience for yourself. So for us, uh, it's taking the news and also using incentives built into that to, you know, teach people more. Uh, in this case, it's about World War I. Cool, and then in terms of just more, you know, the game side of things, Jake, so you're developing something right now with augmented reality. So you talked earlier about your varied experiences in entertainment, you know, in TV and other, you know, publishing aspects. Um, and, you know, VR and AR had a moment, like seven years ago, right, where everyone was on board and it kind of just disappeared. So why go back to AR? Why choose this medium now versus what it was, you know, arguably a little bit more popular, you know, six to seven years ago? Yeah, because um, I'm a sicko. No. Uh, so, <laughs> all right. So, immersive really is a gradient of reality when I think about it. 
unlike the most immersive side where the digital experience is completely obscuring the physical world, where you are completely immersed within the space, or a game is kind of where we're kind of like leaning into like the virtual reality side of things. And then there's kind of gradients into like mixed reality all the way through to augmented reality, which is projecting digital things into your physical space. That can be with a headset, that can be through your phone and using the camera on your phone to see those things. Um, Pokemon Go, which is I think what we're talking about, which is still clearing like almost a billion dollars a year, which is crazy. <laughs> um, more than anything is a testament to Pokemon as a IP. Um, Niantic, which is the company that makes that game, have not had another hit game, mm -hmm. um, at least in the world of geolocation. And geolocation is a subset of augmented reality um, that is specifically, you know, all augmented reality is is inputs, outputs, right? So you take the input of where you are physically located and you get the output of a gym where you can fight or a certain Pokemon that might appear. Um, what we find interesting at Jadu, which is the company um, we're building, we've got an app that's out. Um, it's an augmented reality fighting game, so think Street Fighter, but in your real world, um, where your world is the arena. It's not a geolocation game. If you want to go play it at a pool, there's not going to be some crazy benefit to that. But what it is taking into account is the physical space that you're in. So it really is focusing on like, think uh, horizontal planes. So like the physical ground is where your character is gonna be. Wall vertical planes, so walls. We have moves where if you get kicked, you actually hit a physical wall. We can tell what that is. Um, and there's a couple other things we're playing around with. Um, and so the reason I choose and go back to this after 10 years exploring really a lot of virtual reality experiences is because you get a really unique relationship with the player, which is their real world. We used to make, uh, we made experiences uh, kind of more recently like a, a bedtime story AR experience that you, the phone can tell where your bed is in the space and the experience won't start until it's like, I recognize that there is a bed in the space and that's kind of like the, the play space that you're working within. If you go to sleep on your bed every single day, you have a very specific relationship with it. Um, when you recontextualize that through a bedtime story AR experience, now when you look at your bed, it triggers that memory that's been formed. Um, and so that we, what we really think about is relationships. It's your relationship with a space, but through the technology of your phone. Um, and that's really special, is kind of going from kind of like doom scrolling into actually using this as like a scope into your real world to see things and immerse yourself in new types of experiences is why I get up in the morning. Awesome. So Moses, um, we're finally going to get to, I think, where a lot of people uh, are interested in. We're going to start talking about AI right now. And so um, AI uh, across the, the gambit of gaming has a pretty back and forth relationship with its consumers and I think the people who create uh, within this space as well. So Moses, recently um, I was on your Twitter and I saw that you wrote about something called the AI Hunger Games. Um, for some context, there has been layoffs both in the gaming industry, the esports industry, and I believe also in the AI world as well. Can you walk us through what you meant by AI Hunger Games and if you can offer any solutions that could keep us away from this scenario again in the future? Yeah, um, at the World Economic Forum, they released a report that predicted 85 million jobs would be lost uh, to AI over the next two years. And that's actually two to three times the impact of COVID. The CEO of Coursera said that most people don't understand the impact of this. It's going to be a bloodbath. Um, my prediction is that it could cause a black swan event, sort of like the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank. and people will be freaked out. And I believe that the easiest way to avoid this situation where everyone gets laid off and or you're trying to fight getting laid off by you know, using AI tools to prove you, you should be kept, that companies should just follow this one rule, which is train everyone first, then lay off, instead of the other way around. Uh, it would actually minimize the pain and suffering people have to deal with. So we have a product that we're working on now um, it's called the AI Mastermind. You can actually find out about it at AIMastermind.team. Uh, 
and it uses AI to teach AI, and we think it could reduce the cost of learning a, an AI skill um, 10x. Right now, it it's a little bit less difficult than learning a new language or an instrument to master a skill, and anyone who's ever used Midjourney will tell you that. It takes a while, a few months of, of effort. And we think that this uh, training system that we've developed could train AI in maybe, instead of $1,000 per person, somewhere between $10 and $100 per person. And we're testing it out like at a large bank uh, shortly. Uh, if that does happen, we are talking to a number of uh, interesting politicians. Like one is the uh, Fiona Ma, who's the state treasurer of California. We talked about maybe creating something uh, where the state can rebate companies for learning to, to train their people uh, to help avoid this collapse. Uh, we're actually talking to the senator of Colorado, Michael Bennett. He was very gracious, so we're just at beginning stages. And I think there's a way to do a public-private project where we can, if we open source the technology, we could reach 100 million people and train them in time. And we're calling this the Manhattan 2 project because it's even harder than building an atom bomb to get 100 million people to create a critical mass of coordinated human cognitive effort. Uh, if we could pull that off, I think we could solve things. This ability to work together to solve problems could unlock many other problems like climate change or ending pandemics, which is another project that we're working on. So that's sort of where we were coming from. But I did want to add one more thing about gamification. Um, one of the first products I did after I left the game business was I, I built an innovation management project and a large bank, you know, bought it for a division. And then they said, you know, we don't know which one's better, so we're going to buy five of them and let you compete. You know, it's like a game, right? So I said, great. And they gave each of us a $5,000 budget and we could pick a division. And everybody just did the same thing. They said, okay, we're going to buy uh, $25, you know, gift certificates to Starbucks and give them a coffee cup that says, I'm an innovator. So when it came to my team, they said, okay, we'll do what everyone else does. So I said, no, put in a slot machine. Give a 30% chance of winning. Because intermittent behavioral uh, reward um, uh, modification is more effective than just giving a prize. If you turn it into a slot machine, they'll keep pulling, and we'll get more ideas out of people. And it worked. We actually produced 10 times more ideas than the other uh, competitors because people were like going, they kept putting it because they wanted that prize, right? They kept putting ideas in uh, until they won one. So the ability to actually gamify successfully depends on whether you have a psychologist who's actually successfully done this before. Uh, so when a, when a company comes to me and says, oh, yeah, we gamify the interface. Gamify is sort of like a jargon word. And I go, yes, who did your gamification and what game awards did they win? Right? If you haven't built an award-winning game, you probably are just using the words and using base-level gamification rather than really tuning it to the psychology of your user and taking it to the next level. So I think those kinds of distinctions are really important uh, to uh, make sure that you uh, succeed in the, in the business world. Mm -hmm. It has to be authentic, right? Yeah. It has to be an authentic experience. Um, uh, so. Uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna go back to um, we had some audience questions come up that are really good and that's just my reminder that if you do have a question just raise your hand and our producer will come find you and bring that note card up here and we'll ask at the end. Um, but yeah, let's actually just go back to um, Billy real quick. Where um, what has been the most obvious benefit of the gamification for you? Um, does it help other aspects of you know the Roca network um, as well that aren't necessarily gamified? Does it increase you? Know, know, people trying to get onto the website a little bit more. What is like the one thing that gamifying has really brought positively to your product? Sure. Um, you know, I, I think it is kind of tough to extract like why gamification works here as opposed to some other thing that's going on in the background that we don't truly understand. Um, we, uh, I, I would say the biggest benefit, at least as, as we perceive it, and you know, we, we talk to our audience and we watch them use our platform is whether or not we can get them to buy into, you know, our quote-unquote game, which is, you know, read the stories, get the experience, compete against others, whatever have you. And if it, it does seem like a binary for us in that, so another part of our 
kind of business models that we believe in news less is more. And obviously that's a, you know, a field that people have a lot of strong opinions on, but I think one of the reasons news has become so problematic is because these companies try to fill this 24 hour news cycle and there's just not that much going on and we have to make stuff up, you make bad things up. So we only deliver a handful of stories a day, uh, five to six stories within our app. If a user comes onto our app and gets through every single story on the first day, say five out of five, there's a 90% chance they come back the next day. And if they don't, that drops to like 20%. Uh, so for us, I, I think it's a great use. It's great if we can get them to buy and assign value to what we're trying to assign value to. If we can't, um, at least on, on the gamification or within the app, we, we kind of lose them. All right, and then now let's talk about a little bit, we're actually gonna go back to the opium dens uh, real quick because something that we've been talking about a lot in gamification, one of the aspects of it working is it kind of feeds into our need as humans for that slot machine almost, right? That like winning an award is a good thing, right? And so we keep interacting with it. And so I've noticed that a lot of things in gaming specifically are now speaking more towards those aspects of the human, you know, psyche versus, you know, authentic experience that makes us want to go back for any other reason. And since we did talk about things like, you know, uh, the opium dens before, how do we avoid those negative impacts? This is also an audience question that I'm kind of combining here, um, how do we avoid, um, you know, people who are predisposed to these things, people who are, who are addicts, people who might have, you know, violent tendencies when the media that we're right now kind of evangelizing in terms of total immersion, right, might affect in a negative way. Um, Jake, because you have, you know, AR and you're working with your, you know, the real world around you, right, um, how do you kind of respond to something like that? Because I think it is something that we definitely need to answer to. Yeah, I mean, the violence thing, I think, is just time and time again been proven to, like, not really be true. Like, I grew up in the age where, you know, parents were really freaking out about kids are playing violent video games. There's not a strong correlation. It just doesn't exist. Now, as games get more immersive, maybe that hijacks your lizard brain in some new way, and we should definitely keep awareness on that. But in terms of, like, the state of gaming today, pretty non-existent. Um, I think, you know, for augmented reality, Pokemon Go, you had people falling into potholes, you know, into like, you know, potholes, walking off cliffs. So I think there's just a kind of base level of human selection that's going on at a certain point. Um, this relationship, again, like I play a lot of video games. I play, you know, I, I, I'll play a, I'll play a six-hour day, ten-hour day um, when the time is there, and I think it's okay for people to unwind. Um, I think where it starts to trend into negative territory is for children. Because if you're, you know, if you're a baseline adult, no addictive personality, that kind of side of it, that's like a whole separate thing we can touch on. But for kids, they don't know better. Um, and you know, they are hitting the button in a way that um, it might as well be, it could be sugar, it could be TikTok, it could be any of those things. And we see that you know, kids are, you know, no surprise, like really bad at that, especially when there's a social component where it's like all of your friends are doing that thing. It's really hard to, uh, mediate that. I think their, you know, GDPR compliance is kind of like a base level um, legal structure that a lot of games are, you know, having to step in line with right now that I think are really good. That goes all the way down to like the terms of service being legible for a child to actually read. Um, will they actually read it? Up or debate. But at least it's there. Um, China, surprisingly, has also had a lot of um, legislation limiting the number of hours that people are allowed to play, the amount they're allowed to spend. Um, so it's a really, it's a tricky one. I think it's falling predominantly on the role of parents, especially when it comes to children, to help mediate that. That is that is their responsibility. Um, when it comes to the interaction with the real world, I think you do want to structure things in a way that people, especially for augmented reality, which is what I'll focus on for this, is you know, uh, map-based augmented reality, maps are, crazy specific. I was walking around campus and it could tell the difference between like this footpath and that footpath five feet apart from each other after I took like two steps. So there's a level of specificity that game creators just need to take into account to kind of like block off some of these pathways so that their game is not populating in places that really don't make sense. I think for us, we use third person remote avatars. So like in, when I'm in an experience, it's me and Billy in a fight together, I'm seeing his avatar in my space, and my avatar is in his space. So 
there's a level of anonymity that's really nice, right? I can't see his physical space. Maybe his bedroom is a mess. <laughs> I can't see any of that. All I see is the avatar. And I think that level of privacy is actually a really, really nice level um, in addition to it, where his, you know, historically, with augmented reality, it's a first-person medium, and you're seeing through the eyes of your character, but now it's becoming, at least from our perspective, a third-person medium where you can see, you know, it's a standalone character in a space, um, and you guys can share an experience without having to necessarily share like the intimate spaces that you operate in. Uh, most of them say the same thing uh, for you because I think the other thing too that kind of popped into my head is a lot of times when I hear people advocate for AI and you know blockchain or other things like that, um, they try to absolve the technology from responsibility, right? That the people creating and working on the technology, it's the pe it's the parents that need to do this, it's you know the schools that need to do this correctly. Whose responsibility is it at the end of the day uh, to make sure that these things lean more on the ethical side? Because I know that's a you know specific interest of yours as well. Yeah, this has been an interesting panel because I haven't been in the game industry a lot for a while, and it's bringing up all these memories. So I right now remember one of the the things that happened and made me decide to, to divest from the game business was I was somewhere public, and then. Uh, some kid ran back to his mother and said, uh, here's the thing I bought for you. And the mother said, where's the change? And then she's, he's looked up, scared, and said there was no change. And then she started screaming at him, you're going to be just like your father. You're an addict. You spent the money on video games, didn't you? You know, and then he was, like, crying and saying, no, Mommy, I promise I didn't spend it on video games. You know, and she, I was just thinking, oh, my God, this kid's going to need therapy, right? Uh, but after seeing that, I took responsibility and got out of the games business because I knew I could make incredibly addictive games and I wasn't going to make cigarettes anymore. Right? I just said, I'm not going to make cigarettes. So I divested, I let the uh, venture capitalists take over the company and you know, they did whatever they did. And I went into something that was more befitting like someone who wants to build a positive society. So that's why I tell uh, game developers, you know, at some point you can say it's the parent's fault but you have to take responsibility and realize that you might be creating tobacco, right? And I don't think there's any way around it. Uh, in terms of ethics with AI, it's the same thing. I think if we, you build AI that annoy people, kill people, or replace people, it's not as good as something that in, improves people or augments their skill base. So I think you need to create things that improve human beings rather than get them addicted. So anyway, that's just my position. I know the game developers will hate me for saying that, but it's the truth. It's at some point you have to say, am I making tobacco? And what am I gonna do about it? And that's a big decision because you have a board that's telling you to make more money. Yeah, I mean, I, okay, I, as the, I will wear the developer hat, I will be the contrarian, <laughs> I will say, look, Within reason, yes, but I think is like, is it the role of developers to be responsible for humans doing unreasonable things with their product? No. If someone is decides to buy a car and then drive it through a crowd of people, that's not Toyota's problem to be like, hey, we should have made a better car. We should have made a car that gives people improvements to their lives or upskills them. That's not the job of a car. The job of a game is to provide, honestly, fun. And then in order, you can come down to like a deep emotional experience. It can improve your life, it can make you rethink all these things, but games are games. But what about a smart car that detects you're about to plow into a, a, a hundred people and you're trying to kill them? Yeah. Shouldn't that car actually say, hey, I'm not gonna do this? We're not talking about a smart car, we're talking about a regular car. You can make a smart game or an educational game, for sure. But no, no, I'm not saying an educational game. I'm saying all games should be somewhat smart. Like, for example, a time limiter on how long you can play. That's called a parent. That's called a government. And those are the parties that are responsible for those things. That is their literal role in life. Like, you can't, <laughs> it's not on the developer. If I'm just messing around and want to make Flappy Bird and someone decides to mainline that for 10 hours a day, those are bad parents. They are. Like, it's not the role of the developer to do that or let the government step in and regulate and say, hey, developers, you have a moral or social or just general responsibility to put that limiter in place. And that's what governments do sometimes. But 
I, they don't I, do it here. I, I think that game developers could actually do that ahead of time so that the government doesn't have to step in and regulate. They could, but it's not their responsibility to do that. They is could. It? No. Is it? Yes, so it does not. Then the question of ethics is whose responsibility is it to build a better world? Not, not the mine. person who's making Flappy <laughs> Bird. That's not, that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to just make something that can be a momentary piece of fun. That is a better world for some people. And that's enough. You don't, as, I don't know, as a developer, working with developers all day, as you're like, there's 100 real practical problems of how to make an actual game, much less having to zoom out to the stratosphere of how is this game impacting society. No one is making games like that. Maybe a couple people, but I don't think it's few I, and far between. Okay, I, I'll agree with you. Uh, for the Apple Vision, I think Apple is responsible for certain things with the, the headset. For example, you shouldn't be riding a bike with a headset. And you are not, like, I, I have one. I use the Apple Vision Pro every single day. If you move, if you walk in the house faster than, like, yeah, you know, a like casual that. stroll, it pops something up. But again, humans are stupid. And if a human <laughs> wants to wear it skiing and they have whatever stupid thing happened to them, <laughs> That's not even on Apple. I'm not even that big of an Apple fan. I, I don't know. I think it is on Apple because they're going to get sued and they're smart enough to put a limiter in place to make sure, or at least. So, a what way is it to supposed to do? If, you're, if someone is wearing it, they walk out of the house, they're wearing it in a normal environment, the environment they're supposed to be in, yeah, and I, they get up and sprint, how exactly is Apple supposed to prevent them from being an idiot? I think that Apple could pop up saying something saying, I think you're riding a bike with a headset, this is not advisable. It does that right now. Right. If you move too That's fast, what it they does do that. Yes, they, they should be doing that. And they're doing it. Yes. So what's the problem? No, I'm, I'm saying we're in a violent <laughs> agreement. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think another aspect of this too is there's like an interesting middle ground because a lot of technology is, not, it is developed and is not used for what it's developed for, uh, for example. Um, I have a personal experience with this. Um, my old company did a government contract that was what I referred to initially for migration purposes after disasters. Of course, that turned into a way... It, it, it ended up turning into a violent type of thing where the governor, uh, where the people could predict best places, you know, to drop a bomb, for example, right? So I feel some personal responsibility for creating that opportunity to potentially do bad, even though it wasn't my intention. Just the fact that it's in the world and capable, I do take some responsibility for that. So what would you kind of like, kind of respond to that? Because I think that's kind of like where Moses totally. is at too, you right? Can, you can, uh, but it's opt in versus opt out. Totally, like, yeah. I, I have a friend, What's the nuance there, right? Yeah, I have a friend who works at an autonomous drone company, one you just, you know, extrapolate, and you're like, I remember when he had the first versions of it and we brought it like skiing and it would follow you through the trees and it was awesome. You got the best footage you could ever get. Of course, there's a military application for it. There's again, there's a military there application for is. this water bottle. <laughs> so, but again, is it like the, I don't even know, is it the water bottle manufacturer's responsibility to be like, how do we not have people, like this could be a soft water bottle, but it doesn't make sense a lot yeah. of the time. I th you're also referring, I think, to the slippery slope of like school shooters, for example, like in video games <sighs> causing violence. And you know, if we, uh, if we accept one thing, right, then it, a lot of other things are going to happen, right? That's probably like the furthest edge. I don't know if I'm gonna go down that rabbit hole, but I think there are outliers that are exceptions to the rule. Okay. Yeah, I yeah. think that's, uh, um, and then Billy, you, like, you're part of like the whole news aspect of this, right? <laughs> do, you, do you see, like, is this something that, so, something I always here. think, we're in this, in, like, we're here, we have these conversations all the time, right? Like, is this something that is genuinely a concern based on like things that you've seen in like particular data and like concerning with gaming, with addiction and like those kinds of things? Yeah, so in terms of, you know, I guess at the end of the day, the capitalistic kind of incentive is to make money, right? So I, I feel like if you're putting, placing responsibility on a private company which operates within this, you know, system the government's created, their incentive is going to be to go all the way. You know, there's not really an incentive built in to stop them from saying, okay, like, let's build a game that plays, people want to play 24 hours a day. And I, I do think, I, I tend to agree that it falls on the parents, at least in the early years, of course, you know, we can talk about later on separately, but... 
it's not just video games, right? Like kids are on TikTok for 12 hours a day, and then as soon as their parents take away their iPad at dinner, they start screaming. And if you're raising somebody like that, it's not gonna be limited to games. It's gonna be anytime they get something they don't want, you know, they freak out. In terms of, I guess, AI coming into news specifically, there's, a, there's the ESPN fiasco, you know, a few, probably a couple months ago at this point, where it turns out, you know, a bunch of the articles on ESPN were written by AI and it wasn't marked and the CEO ended up getting fired. People don't want, I mean, beyond the fact that they were lying, people don't want AI in news They're, or, or disseminating information. There was uh, this app called Artifact, which went out of business um, a few months ago. It was an operation for less than a year. It was started by Kevin Systrom, the founder of Instagram. So, you know, the guy knew what he was doing in terms of apps, at least he did once. Uh, and it was a news feed that was aggregated by an AI. And this was supposed to be the cutting edge, like we're gonna find you the articles that you wanna see and we'll put them there for you. And it just didn't do anything for people. Um, so, you know, I guess you can also ask, like, is that because it wasn't good enough or did people just not want AI disseminating information? Um, and yeah, I just talked about a few things, but it's, at least in the news business itself, AI maybe can help with processes, but I don't think we're at the point where people want a robot reading them, you know, current events. Cool. Um, uh, in the most of any, fi any final, uh, you know, wrap-ups here for your your side of the, you know, you, you've compared gaming with cigarettes at this, you know, and a lot of addictive uh, properties at this point, and you specifically said that you came out of it. Are you optimistic at all about any of the, like, the gaming aspects for the future? Yeah, actually, you know, I love games a little too much, and like I've always said, if you want to get over a video game addiction, start a video game company. So, That's really, really good advice. Yeah. So, <laughs> no, I, I think it's a beautiful thing That's to so create uh, entertainment and to relieve stress in people. I'm just, you know, concerned that if you have a single focus of being successful, engagement is what makes bring success, and you could over focus on too much engagement. Actually, in Japan, someone has actually died playing a video game. A couple he, people in South, couple. Car uh, South Korea have died playing League of Legends, yeah. for example. So, so, yeah. so it, there is an issue around this digital opium stuff, but I think that's the interesting... No, I want to see that happen simply because I think that'll make better product. But anyway. Yeah, and then um, Jake, to kind of put a cherry on top of that uh, as well. Do you have anything? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think we're in... The, I mean, we are in the golden age of gaming, not because there are massive companies making massive games, like Call of Duty numbers are tanking hard yeah, because good. people are like, we're over it. <laughs> we don't need another Call of Duty. But we're in the golden age of gaming because a small developer, a, a solo developer, has the ability to distribute a game direct to consumer for you know 30% of the take rate or just put it up on a website. They have the tools available through Unity, Unreal Engine, you can make a game that looks like a AAA game with a laptop right now. Like, it is, there is no better time than now to be making games. And the people who are making the games with the laptop in their bedroom, some of them are doing it for financial game. Most of them are because they have something they want to tell. They have some weird, you know, crazy little story that they want people to experience. And that's really special. And it doesn't have to make $100 million, $200 million, $500 million to break even. It can make $100,000, and it's life-changing money. That is why we're in the golden age of it. And that's why I think like I have a lot of hope for games for that reason, because the gradient is expanding exponentially in terms of the types of games, the types of experience you can have while playing games. And of course, digital opium's over here. I play Overwatch 2. Every damn day. I'm, I'm sorry not. about that. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a game that you're like, am I getting any, like, am I a better person when I play it? <laughs> not really, but am I staying close with, like, my closest high school friends still? Yeah. 100%. And that's special. So if that means a little bit of digital opium, so be it. All right, and then, Billy, your, your last kind of question is the kind of the, the same thing. Like, what are you most optimistic about? Um, I also stole this from a fan card as a, a fan <laughs> question as well, so thank you so much. But what are you, like, most excited about when it comes to the future? We've been, I, I would say, leaning on the negative end here, talking about AI and, and stuff. So what is something that you're excited to see? 
Uh, sure. So I, I think, you know, we can, as was mentioned earlier, you can use gamification in games for good. Um, and, you know, from my perspective, from our perspective as a company that's using incentives that, you know, we learn about through seeing video games created to make people read the news or be more engaged. The news participation rate amongst Gen Z and millennials is extremely low. Um, so if you can take a process that, you know, is boring, and, and it's not also not, you know, people have this pretend that thing that the curiosity gene totally skipped over Gen Z and they're just, all they want is short form video, and that's just not true. I mean, people will sit down and watch three hour YouTube podcasts. Um, you just have to make a better product, and if you can use gamification to make products that help society better, I think that's a net positive. I would also say just to get over that initial hump, like you were talking about, if you read the five articles, you're in, but to get, like for us, there's like the, the tutorial for augmented reality is like the drop off rate before people have like really understood like, whoa, my room is the space, my phone is the camera, I can move in space. The moment they understand that, people are back on a very consistent basis, but to get people over that hump, to get them to read five articles, to get them to play one augmented reality fighting game, I think that's where gamification can really just like tip you over the edge and maybe force you out of your initial comfort zone, which is good. Yeah, what I'm gonna add is uh, the best advice I can give to a gaming company is if someone offers you a license to a uh, character like the Smurfs and the only thing you could think of is Smurficide, <laughs> you've got a problem. You really have to like expand your horizons and think maybe there's something else I can do. Um, I remember when I uh, released my first, um, you know, flight simulator game, the, a guy named Will came out with this really crazy game that was based on city management. It was called Sim City, and we released it at the same time. He made a lot of money, right? <laughs> and uh, my game is now forgotten, pretty much. So I think it's possible to do very interesting games that are successful without pulling that switch thing. I'm just gonna get that primal instinct uh, satisfied. Because it is very fun to you know, kill things. Uh, so I, I'm just urging people to like expand your horizons a little bit. Yeah, some of the best games that have come out recently are not violent, you know. Yes. I mean, COVID was saved by Animal Crossing, right? So, um, for, for a lot of people. So, I think we're kind of expanding. There's a, another really cool game that only advances when you blink, for example, and just shows the story of your life. That was you guys? Yeah, I produced that. Okay. Oh, is that wow. the BAFTA? And you're in the, in the yeah, 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 that's yeah. the BAFTA. So, uh, Before Your Eyes, I think, is what it's called. Before um, Your Eyes, yeah. Mind-blowing, made me cry. Uh, the two, the three creators have been working on it. They started in college and you all should too, anyone who's trying to make games, but yeah, yeah that game is like wow. one of the most special games I've ever, I've ever seen. Yeah, <laughs> there's a- even make games at that point. There's we, a point where you're like playing piano and based on where you look at on the piano, like a certain story comes out. Um, games like Journey, like single player experiences um, too. So I think, that, I think we're getting there. It's definitely a lot better um, than it was, but we only have about 10 minutes remaining. Uh, so we're gonna get to some of these audience questions. I try to loop some of them into the regular questioning. So Hopefully that was good for you guys. Um, but here, I think let's talk to Moses here. Is there anything in the gaming space here that you can see affecting potentially policy in a positive way for you know countries or governments around the world? Maybe helping with the environment, mental health. Is there anything that you can like point us to specifically that we can get excited about? Yeah, you, you know, one of the things I'd like to address is depolarization of you know the world. I I think something like uh, there was a game called, what's it called, Virus or Infection? It's Pandemic, pandemic right? So I, I think if you created games where you could win by killing the virus, it, it could teach you what strategies actually worked, might help people align on what the correct strategies are instead of like violently disagreeing how to uh, treat a pandemic. So I think that there are ways of using gaming. Uh, in, in fact, when we were working for UNICEF, we had bid that project to build a, uh, a COVID uh, I mean, a polio uh, simulator for them to play, but uh, and to drive awareness about these things. So uh, yeah, I think that you can tef definitely do games, but they're not going to make a lot of money. Um, cool. Any, any? I mean, this is a fun one. Any, anything else that kind of like pops into the equation, like something that you saw that you were like, that's that's pretty cool. <laughs> Your own game doesn't count. <laughs> 
Yeah, how do you gamify depolarization? <laughs> like in the news industry, right? Yeah. How do you tell uh, gamified truth, uh, I'm sorry, um, fact checking? Well, fact checking, I guess, would be another issue. But I think in terms of depolarizing it, um, if you can use gamification to make nonpartisan news exciting and worth clicking on, I think that's a win. Because, I mean, these companies' business models for so long have kind of driven them apart. Like, com news companies in the advertising business that just put banner ads up on their website live off how many people click on the page. So the more incendiary of a title you can write, the better. And if, you know, one company sees their competitors doing that and driving all this ad revenue, they're going to say, we need to do the same thing, and it just gets worse and worse. On the subscription front, uh, you know, you start to pander to that audience over time, the people that pay you for the news, and that's going to push you further to a side as well. Uh, so if you can monetize via gamification, which is what we're trying to do, and people paying to deepen the experience of a nonpartisan news experience, uh, then you're winning. I would also throw in as another another experience. Uh, I think The Last of Us 2, in terms of depolarizing, depolar um, one of the best of all time. Um, it's super violent, so that's the bad news. But it's it's all about opposing parties and how do they can they find common ground. The violence, they, I would say, makes sense in that game, though. Yeah. If that makes sense, um, it's a little bit more intentional. That's fair. Yeah. Um, cool. So uh, we're going to go back into a little bit of the negative side of things. So it is, it is pretty well known that in esports and gaming, um, the community can sometimes not be that nice, especially, especially to each other. Um, and with video games, there is um, anonymity attached to it. So how do, how do we even begin to solve that problem? Obviously, we've all, if, if you've played League of Legends or Overwatch in the last you know, 24 hours, you've experienced probably some type of uh, harassment based on a variety of things that they might, they're, they're never going to learn about you, right? So that is definitely something that we all have to try to attack. But, you know, there's, you know, free speech, you know, uh, people out there. There are people who are using it for content uh, itself when, you know, a situation happens uh, because the gaming community does tend to like content like that. So how do we fight against that? We'll go just down the table here, starting with Jake. Yeah, Overwatch is easily the most toxic community in all of gaming. So <laughs> I, I'm on the front lines of that every single day. Um, yeah, uh, I think one thing that actually is super effective is uh, reporting. The players have the option to report text harassment, video hara or uh, voice harassment, and basically people end up in a shouting into a, a vacuum where it's like they, they can still see all the conversations, hear all the conversations, but they can't respond or do anything, and that lasts for increasingly extended periods of time, and I think that... I have a friend who's pretty toxic, and I, I've noticed is like as they've improved their reporting, it has gotten better. On the immersive side of things, there's you know you are embodied in VR experiences, so you have a physical body. You know people are coming up doing like weird stuff. Um, so that one's that one's difficult too. But I think reporting there's like a lot of good modern reporting systems, and I think AI is actually that's one of the best use cases for it is to actually just be able to review thousands, millions of hours of voice recordings and text recordings um, to determine if people should get a ban. Now, I think the question is, like, who is programming those AIs to make those decisions um, is, a, is a really um, interesting one. There, uh, we were dealing with this, thinking about it a little bit for our game, and, you know, I, there was kind of like a list of words that I felt, I was like, I feel like pretty much everyone in the world is on the same page. These are not words we should be saying in a, you know, fighting game that's for kids through adults, um, but I, it started to get complicated. I was like, oh, one of those words like, is like a totally normal name in, in certain countries, so, ah, like where do you go from there? <laughs> um, so it's a, it's a tricky one. I think it's really, really difficult, but I do think the reporting structure, like community-based reporting is strong. I think it works quite well, actually. Yeah, I, I would tend to agree with that. I mean, coming out of those Call of Duty lobbies back in the day, you know. <laughs> It, it got pretty ugly. I, I guess what we try to do at least is elevate good behavior, and I think that's much more difficult in a situation where you're dealing with like, you know, a fighting game or something kind of totally detached from like the news. Uh, but so you, we have like this discussion platform uh, on, uh, on our app and people can vote for their favorite answers. And you know, if you just kind of let that play out, it ends up being like the funny ones probably that get the most upvotes or the hateful ones. Uh, but maybe my faith in humanity is just low. But we pick the answers ourselves. Like people submit a few thousand, and then we pick like the top ten. We call it, um, and people can go ahead and upvote on those. So 
it's kind of a mix of moderation uh, from our end and uh, letting the community decide. And, and we try not to go overboard. Like, if someone's saying some stuff that's weird, you know, let it fly, uh, as long as they're not, you know, being hateful towards people or just mean. Yeah, uh, one area I thought would be interesting to study is there's a, a technique called nonviolent communication, NVC. I've always thought that would be a very interesting thing to encode into discussion forums, that it can detect when people have very uh, disparate uh, sentiment analysis, and then it could uh, engage and provide some of that technique to reunify the uh, community. But it's a really tough problem. Yeah, I, I know, I, I recently saw that Riot Games themselves are just talking about just how tough it is because of how like culturally based a lot of things are that, you know, it's not consistent across, you know, multiple countries and, you know, and just how difficult it is, it would be to train something on something like that. Um, and I would not, you know, love to be the person training that AI and being exposed to all of that stuff too. Because that's something else that I think we all kind of really underestimate when it comes to moderation. Um, even from Twitch, you know, or something really small, it's just you're exposed to some pretty rough stuff. So um, uh, it's, it's important to kind of just know that going in. Um, but on that note, we have just, I think, a, a couple minutes left and I wanted to go down the line and just have you guys talk about what you're doing right now and if you have anything that you're working on for us to check out um, what it is. You're doing your own shout outs uh, for, for this and you know I'm I'm the esports guy. We got to do it this way. So um, yeah, Jake, why don't you start like uh, talk about the game you're working on right now, uh, where we could potentially find that media kit and uh, what you're working on next? Yeah, uh, you can find the game at www.jadu j a d u dot a r um, augmented reality fighting game for your phone. We actually have a really really big season one release coming up May 14th. All new characters from all around the world cinematic single player mode um, and a bunch of other updates. So yeah, it's actually a really good time, uh, I think, to be getting on the, on the train. Cool. Um, so I mean, we have the app, you know, we're, we're across a few platforms, but uh, the easiest would probably be to go on Instagram and follow us uh, at Ride the News, like Ride the Wave, but Ride the News, um, where we do like very quick kind of daily news snippets. Uh, if you want to be informed, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, sure. If you uh, like to have some fun learning AI skills, come and check us out at uh, www.aimastermind.team. And if you're interested in this Manhattan 2 project, you can come to Manhattan 2, number 2 dot team as well. And we'd love to talk to you about it and, you know, see where we can go. Awesome, and for, I think I was able to touch on all of the audience questions. If not, um, I, uh, I'm i sorry, we are running out of time at this point. Uh, so thank you so much for your participation, uh, and we really appreciate the knowledge that you guys shared. It was uh, it was, it was learning about a wide-ranging uh, thing when it comes to gaming, I think, I, and I hope that you guys in the audience, um, or everyone in the audience kind of understands that gaming isn't just the controller to the screen. It is everything that we just talked about. It is involved in a lot of our lives. If, if we know it or not, it's definitely a part of it. And I think being knowledgeable and aware of where these things are going is only gonna be helpful for you as we go into the future. So thank you to our panelists once again. Thank you guys for listening. And that's gonna be the end of our panel, which is gaming and immersive experience, uh, spaces um, and the future of gaming. So thank you guys very much. Thank you. Thank you.